Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be able to talk to some of you guys last night that I got to call if we contacted you twice, which I'm sure we did. Some folks, I apologize, but I'm telling you what, what a gracious thing it is this morning that we're all able to come here together still. Um, the church is still standing, your houses are still standing, and everyone was spared from what could have been a disaster. So the grace of God was is just really upon us, and I pray that we look back on 2020 and we don't necessarily remember it as this time of pandemics and storms as much as we remember it as a time of God's grace in the midst of pandemics and storms. If you would please with me this morning, we're going to start a brand new sermon series that will go on for about the next month. I'm calling it the Overcomers series. This is going to be about overcoming all these problems in this fallen world, overcoming them in Christ and spiritually. So this morning, if you would please turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians. That's a little bit more difficult, smaller book to find. It's right before Timothy in your Bibles. Let me give you a second more to find it. 2 Thessalonians. While you're getting there, this, uh, this letter was written by Paul, and it, it's... It was written about 50-something A.D. to the church in Thessalonica. This is really the model church um, that we see in Scripture, a very model church that uh, many theologians have said churches even model themselves after because they were so such a model church. But this church was not a stranger to suffering. They were not a stranger to controversy and adversity. So let's start with verse 10 in chapter 1. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Therefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we do come before your throne this morning, how can we ask anything of you before we thank you, before we exalt you? Father, you're so mighty, you're so worthy, the amount of grace bestowed upon us as individuals and corporately is astonishing still even this morning. Father, as your under-shepherd here, thank you for protecting this, your flock, last night. Father, thank you for every soul even that you've put under my care, under, your, under you, the great shepherd. Lord, please continue to sanctify me in this process. Lord, please continue to draw all your sheep unto yourself as you promised. Father, be with me now as I come to bring your people a word of encouragement from your word. Be with them. Open their eyes so that they may see. Enlighten their ears that they may hear. Quicken their feet and their hearts that they may react. I ask this all in your holy name. Amen. So this new series this morning, I, I specifically want to focus on dealing with problems, dealing with uh, all these problems that are coming upon us as children of God. This is going to be about, this series is about over, today, as we're focusing on overcoming, it's going to be specifically this morning about overcoming setbacks and overcoming bad things, overcoming sufferings. So this morning, are you suffering? Are you suffering? There were a lot of you guys that were on my heart's while I was writing this sermon over this last week, I thought about you and I thought about the suffering you're going through, whether it be emotional or, or physical or relational. What are your setbacks? What are your sufferings this morning? I, I'm challenging you to consider that as you're listening to the preaching. But before we get into this preaching, I want to answer a question as it relates to suffering. It's a really easy answer, so this won't take long. Why do bad things happen to good people? 
Why do good people have to suffer? And the answer is simple. Bad things don't happen to good people because there are no good people. Scripture is very clear on that. No one's good. No, not one. Bad things don't happen to good people. The problem of evil in the world, as it's called, or uh, the theodicy dilemma, as it's called in theology, is not really a hard thing to deal with. If you're honest about yourself and the human race and our condition, bad things don't happen to good people. That's not the issue. The issue of why bad things happening to us isn't the dilemma. Because, folks, you and I deserve hell, eternal suffering. So why these bad things are happening to us now is just simply not a dilemma. Our dilemma is not why is bad things happening to us, but why is anything good happening to us? That's the ultimate dilemma that we have, is the problem of goodness in an evil world. So let's keep that in our minds as we're dealing and thinking about suffering. You know, I myself, I've, I've had my fair share of pain in life. Um, so I'm, I'm talking to you about this, not as just somebody, a uh, theologian or a pastor looking at scripture, but from somebody experientially who suffers. I still suffer from back pain from my time in the army. Um, growing up, I grew up in suffering and I grew up in it so deep in it, I didn't even know that anything different was happening to me. Um, I grew up, me and my brother and my sister were all extremely abused children by my blood father. Um, my mother was a battered wife. We had to flee after some years living with him and hid in a place called a safe homes with other battered women and children. And uh, it's just a really hard childhood. I still bear scars on my body from where he put cigarettes out on me and as such. So I, I know something about suffering. Um, but what I, what I do also know is even when I look back on my suffering as a child, the suffering, that suffering is not just something that just happened on chance, but it was something God decreed. And it's something that I look back upon and I thank Him for it. I actually thank Him that I went through that. This grew me into the image of God. This was like God spit shining me. And through such things like that, He's grown me in sanctification in a way that I can love and forgive anybody. And I can bear all things. And I can pray for anyone, as I still pray for him and the salvation of his soul. Maybe you're suffering this morning the same way I suffered as a kid. Maybe you're a battered wife. Maybe you're an abused child. Maybe you're suffering financially. Maybe you're suffering from loneliness. Maybe a tree fell on your house. Um, maybe you're suffering lies and accusation and abandonment or physical pain. So third, first their second Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians, is written to the model church. And they were experiencing trials and troubles at this time. This letter Paul writes is giving them encouragement through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So why are you suffering this morning? Why are you suffering? Why are these bad things happening to you? We're going to look at three ends. I think is found in uh, my exegesis of this portion of scripture. Three ends of why you're suffering. Three so let's start with our first one this morning. One of the reasons, one of the ends, one of the reasons that you're suffering this morning is for your sanctification. It's for your sanctification. Paul says, to this end we pray for you, that God make you worthy. That he make you worthy. Now, how does God make us worthy? How does he make us worthy? Beloved, it is by sanctifying us. It is by sanctifying us. Sanctification is God setting us apart from sin and setting us apart unto holiness. We're being set apart from the world and we're being set apart to God. It's like when I joined the army and I was in boot camp. You know, everyone was so excited to get a beret. Everyone was so excited to wear the, the beret that we used to wear back then. And they didn't just let you have that coming into the army or coming into boot camp. You, you weren't allowed to wear many things back then um, until you actually passed boot camp. There was this idea of they were taking civilians and making us worthy for certain things. You had to, you had to, to do and go through certain things to get to an end where you could wear a beret, where you, where you would get a unit patch and the such. They were making us worthy of it as it was. They were sanctifying us as a soldier in this sense. 
is set apart from a civilian world and set us apart into a military world. The suffering of the church in Thessalonica, even at this time around 50 AD, was to sanctify this church. Your suffering is for your sanctification this morning. Suffering, it must come so that the passions of God can be worked out. And suffering must come so that the presence of God can be needed. Suffering must come so that the peace of God can be valued. And suffering must come so that the power of God can be exercised in your life. If you're suffering this morning, take heart. You're being sanctified. And if you're being sanctified, you're going to be glorified. And if you will be glorified, then the image of God in you will be something that will be actualized. We need sanctification, beloved. We need sanctification this morning. We need our sin to be mortified in us. As John Owen said, you know, we pray for the day that the sin that besets us will be seen laying dead at our feet. We need sanctification. We need our idols to be bashed. We need sanctification. We need our false worldly securities to be challenged. We need sanctification. We need our flesh to be brought under the mighty Spirit of God. I'll never forget the pain that I felt in my body when I was coming off drugs before I was saved. It was an awful pain, but it was a necessary pain. It, is, it was the birth pain of sobriety. It was the birth pain of normality. It was the birth pains of freedom. And so it is with this pain of sanctification. It's the birth pains of something glorious. It's the pain of death of the old man. It's, it's giving way to the pleasure of the birth of the new man. It's the pain of the dethroning of false gods within you. And it's giving way to the pleasure of the throning of the true God within you. It is the pain of the temporal fading away and giving way to the joy of an eternal reigning. We need the pain of sanctification. We need our eyes taking off the world and put on Christ. We need to be reminded of that, beloved, every title that you gain this morning, every degree that you may get in college, all the money that you may save on your way to the grave, all of that is going to be lost. All of these things are going to be destroyed. Everything in this world is rotting, decaying, and dying. Live for what and who is eternal. Live this morning for what will last. Our suffering also, it doesn't just sanctify us, but our suffering sanctifies others. You know, I, I, I thought of a, a, a lady who's in so much pain from her back in our church and some of the people that have sent her cards or some of, you know, she's in a relationship, and this man that's coming along her, alongside her, having to be long-suffering with her and her pain to help her. I thought of when the tree fell at Molly's house, and then all these people that pulled together. I saw this just great example in Molly's yard, with chainsaws going and bobcats driving around, of people being sanctified. That suffering, the suffering that that family went through, was sanctifying a church community around them. Thank God for the pain that is setting us apart from sin and setting us apart for and to God this morning. Secondly, the second ends I want to point to this morning of why we're suffering. So we're not only suffering for our sanctification, but you're also suffering for eternal security. Eternal security. Look at what Paul says here in chapter 1. He gives a purpose clause. This is a purpose clause. He, he's defining the ends here. We don't have to be creative. So suffering is the means, but to what ends? The first ends, making us worthy, sanctifying us. Then next, it's our very salvation. It's, it's our security in Christ. This is what Paul is going on and on about if you read all of chapter 1. 
He talks about the day of salvation and the day of judgment. This is being worked out for us here and now through our suffering. Those causing suffering are going to be judged according to Paul. We can take peace and find rest in that. Everything's either going to be handled at the cross or it's going to be handled in the day of judgment, but suffering is dealt with in one of those two places. Those things causing us to suffer, like the decaying of our, our bodies with physical pain, that stuff will be ended. But right now, we need to understand this with it. Listen, watch this. It says, literally in the Greek here, that God is fulfilling every resolve for good and faith by His power. Now listen to that. Let me read it again. God is fulfilling, He's fulfilling every resolve for good by faith through His power. Resolve, literally in Greek, is, it means good pleasure, kind intention, good will, favor, happiness. Beloved, this is the anatomy of what keeps a Christian joyous in suffering. This is what keeps us joy, joyous. Suffering is where the passions of God are worked out. Not yours. This is where the passions of God are worked out. Not yours. This is where your passions need to bend and conform to the passions of the Lord. To fulfill is to complete or to finish. So, here's a question. We, knowing all that, what is the completed, finished, good pleasure of God toward us in faith by His power? What is the completed, finished, good pleasure of God in us by faith by His power? It is our salvation. It is our salvation. This is salvific language. And it's for His glory, according to Paul at the end of chapter 1 here. This is salvific language. In Christ, listen to me, you who are suffering this morning, in Christ, your suffering is producing an eternal salvation. Your suffering is producing an eternal salvation. It's, your suffering is pronouncing an eternal security. Your suffering is providing an eternal hope. Take heart in this. You know, the Protestants notice this clearly in Scripture taught against Catholic lives. We call it perseverance of the saints, or as some have said before, once saved, always saved. But as I think Spurgeon said rightfully, you know, we call it the perseverance of the saints. But it is very much the perseverance of the Lord within us. It's the perseverance of the Lord within us. If suffering, if your suffering could draw you away from your salvation, it would. It certainly would. The very fact that he is using this that should make us fall away from our faith, he's using this suffering, the thing that should make you turn away in faith, he's using it to solidify it, is the evidence that the faith that we possess is a supernatural faith. And as Paul says, it is by his power. It is not by your effort, which is why suffering will not cause you to fall away from the faith. It was, if it was simply by your effort, then your suffering would exhaust you. It would get you so down and doubtful that you may lose your salvation. And I should be fearful as a minister when I hear people with back pains or relational sufferings because they could lose their salvation. Not so, according to Paul. Your, your suffering is actually securing it by his power. Not your effort. It's by His power, according to Paul. The Lord started the good work of salvation in you, and He's going to finish it. Let me show you what Jesus said in John chapter 6. This is not my words. This is the words of the reigning King of glory. John 6, Jesus said, All that the Father... Did you hear that? All, all that the Father has given me will come to me. All, all of them will come to him. He says, I've come to do the will of him who sent me. What's the will of him who sent me? He says, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing, nothing of all that he has given me, but raise him up on the last 
day. This is exactly what Paul is telling them. Read all of chapter 1. He says, Jesus says, no one, no one can pluck them from my hand. This is the almighty hand of God. You know, some have said, I've talked to people before and they've, I've told them, Jesus has said, no one, no one can pluck you from his hand. And they said, but it doesn't say that I can. Beloved, let me encourage you this morning. This is not how we interpret scripture. We don't interpret scripture based on what it doesn't say. It says nobody. You're a somebody. It says nobody. I think it's really clear. If you're to interpret scripture by what it doesn't say, I mean, it doesn't say that a butterfly can't pluck you out of his hand. It also doesn't say in 1 Timothy that a brick wall can't be a preacher. We interpret scripture based on what it does say, not on what it doesn't say. What it doesn't say is basically endless, and you can read anything into it that way. That's not proper. It does say that nobody can pluck you from his hand. Nothing can pluck you from the hand of the Lord. And not even any depth of suffering that you're in this morning. If you have eternal life today, it is in fact eternal. It's eternal life if you have it today. Some have said, yes, but we're all eternal. Yes, but Jesus talks of eternal life and eternal death. He talks about the second death. And he talks about eternal life. Don't confuse that. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our salvation. Not you, lest you be works-based. He starts it, he initiates it through regeneration, and he finishes it. He brings it to completion through progressive sanctification unto glorification. He's mapped out every struggle, every pain, every problem that you're experiencing unto the ends of your salvation. The mighty hand of God that made the universe holds you secure in salvation. Beloved, the hand of God that holds you safe in suffering, this is also the hand of God that collects your tears in suffering. He counts your hairs in suffering. He clothes your body in suffering. And this is the hand of God that will crown your head at the end of this suffering. Your salvation, beloved, thank God, your salvation is safe from Satan, is safe from sin, is safe from suffering, and is safe even from yourself. Look, if you could lose your salvation, if you could lose it, you would. You would totally lose it. Beloved, let me put it to you simply. You can't even keep track of all your socks. You can't even not lose a sock. But you think it's on you to not lose your salvation. Don't believe such a lie. God is securing your salvation. Thank the Lord that he's the keeper of our promised salvation this morning. And lastly, and quite simply, the ends, the last ends I want to point to this morning for your suffering. Why do bad things happen? Why is suffering happening to you? To the ends of God's glory. To the ends of God's glory. So this, this sanctification and the security of our salvation, but also the glory of God, according to Paul here in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians. The stress of Scripture, though, check this out, the stress of Scripture is not on the glorification of the saved. The stress of Scripture is on the glorification of the Savior of the saved. So while sanctification is a personal good that gets you to eternal salvation, the glorification of God is the greatest good. It is the greatest good. In 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul actually tells that the purpose of every trial is so that the Lord will be glorified in them. So that the Lord will be glorified in them. God is being glorified even now in your suffering. In your suffering. He's conforming you to the very image of Christ. Your suffering is all about the glory of God, which is why it won't fail. It can't fail. Your suffering, it won't be wasted. Your suffering, it matters. Your suffering is ordained and decreed to you. Your suffering, it should bring you joy. Oh, beloved, see the glorious day your body of pain and death is rid of pain and death. Oh, see that glorious day when this fallen nature gives way to an eternal nature. Oh, see that glorious day when the temporal things give way to these eternal things. See that glorious day 
that your loneliness is cured by the crowdedness of the celestial city. See those glorious day. God will get his glory out of all things, beloved. Out of all things. Make no mistake of that. That's why this universe exists precisely the way it's existing. And he'll get his glory out of everything. Either your just destruction and judgment in hell, or our gracious salvation and eternal security in heaven. If God were to throw me in hell today for his glory, I believe with the old preachers that all of creation should stand on its feet and applaud God for getting rid of me from his existence. Because I'm a problem. And I'm a sinful rebel to his throne. And I don't deserve anything else outside of grace. If God's to throw me in hell, you should stand and the rest, all of creation should stand and applaud him as I'm thrown into hell. And then worship him forever for doing that. But let me tell you something else about God's glory. What a beautiful object lesson you are going to be one day in Christ. When all of creation, when angels watch you, once a rebel to the throne, deserving eternal destruction and judgment in hell, when they watch you walk through the gates of the celestial city and the Lord himself comes up to you, happy to see you, puts a crown on your head, makes you joint heirs with him, and then you judge angels and such beside him and rule and reign with the risen Lord for eternity, you are going to be the biggest object lesson of grace, mercy, and unconditional love that is really conditional upon Christ that the universe could ever see. Angels are going to look at you and the rest of creation speechless. Because until that happens, there have been nothing ever witnessed like it. And you're going to be that object lesson. So in closing this morning, in closing, God's using our sufferings and our problems not to overcome you. These, these things are not going to overcome you. But they're to make an overcomer of you. Make an overcomer of you. You have pain. Beloved, through and by Christ, you'll overcome it. You, you're going through abuse. Through and by and in Christ, you'll overcome it. Depression, through, by, and in Christ, you'll overcome it. Addictions, through, by, and in Christ, you'll overcome it. Pain, abuse, depression, addictions, whatever others, you will overcome these things for the glory of God. Because that's, that's the whole purpose that he's decreed them to you. You're not to be overcome by, the, by suffering power. You're, not to be, you're to be overcoming by sanctifying power. You're to be overcoming by the securing power of the glory of God. You're an overcomer for the glory of God, for the one who's coming. He is sustaining you. You will overcome by his power. He gave you these trials and tribulations to mold you for eternity, for eternity, to fashion you for greatness. Post in the comments. I'm encouraging you to post in the comments in the section here on Facebook, what you're an overcomer of. What has God made you an overcomer of? What suffering has God decreed upon you to spit shine you into the image of the sun? Post it in the comment section. What suffering has God brought you through in the past, like he's brought me through drugs and child abuse and such? What has he brought you through? Give God all the credit for your suffering. Praise God for the sanctification of suffering, which produces eternal security unto the glory of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, your might is so seen and understood in our suffering. Your presence so felt in our suffering. Your glory just bleeding through everything in our suffering. How mighty must you be that you could take something like suffering that should crush our spirits 
And you use it to raise our spirits. You take this thing like suffering in us, Lord, that should just get rid of all of our joy, and you use it to, produ to, pro to produce eternal praises and joys even here on earth in the midst of it. This must be regenerating power seen. This must be the Holy Spirit coming in through, around, and out of our sufferings. Because God, I know it isn't us. It can't be us. We're simply tools in this. Your might is just so astounding when we consider it, Lord. Thank you for showing us such power through our sufferings. Thank you for giving us such peace and joy in it. Father, I offer up on your altar this morning. Father, we got people that would come to the altar because they're suffering, but they can't because they're physically unable to. We got people that would come to the altar for suffering this morning, but they can't. They're being abused and not even able to leave the home. Father, I lay these people before your altar this morning. I lay the drug addicts and the abused people and the depressed people and the people in pain all before your altar this morning. Father, you see all their inabilities and you see their sufferings. We say you're able. I know what you can do, Father. I know the peace that you can give and I know the regenerating power that you possess. Father, pour it out upon these people this morning. If you're not, if it's not your will to relieve them of these sufferings this morning, Father, do as Paul, through the power of your Holy Spirit, has promised that he would do and bring them into sanctification. Preserve them as you promised into the palm of your hand. And Father, we hope to see you glorified mightily in these things. Raise up preachers and raise up teachers and raise up evangelists and raise up heirs to your throne. Father, we're going to give you all the praise and the glory for the rest of our lives and unto eternity for being who you are. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen.